Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. What a joy it is to be worshiping together with you today. As we are called together for worship today, will you please stand for a prayer? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to be together in your presence again this morning. We thank you that you have awoken our spirits and brought us into your holy house once again. As we assemble here, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, every movement and thought be worthy and honoring of you. For Father, you alone are worthy of all our worship and praise. We give you this time and ask you to send now your Holy Spirit, to govern our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, good morning. Let's sing about our Redeemer this morning. Thank you. 
Brothers and sisters, will you join me as we confess together words of our common Christian faith from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross.
Psalm 119, verses 103 through 105. How sweet are your words, O Lord, to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. are the light for our path. Lord, without you, we walk in a world of complete darkness. We have no light to lead us, but it is by you. It is by your word that we have wisdom. We have strength. We have counsel. We have guidance. And so, Father, what we need more every single day is, is you and your word in our life. And so, Father, would you give us more every single day? Would you bring us back to your word every single day? Would you speak your word into our lives, into our minds, into our hearts? Even those days, Father, when we forget to pick up our Bibles, when we forget to open them, would you speak your word into our lives? For, Father, it is the light for our path. You are the light for our path. And so, Lord... We desperately need you and your word every day in our lives. Father, thank you for gathering us in this place this morning. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning once again. And welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you have gathered us for worship, gathered with us for worship this morning. If you are here for Sunday school this morning, would you please make your way to the back of the sanctuary? Our teachers are ready to meet with you this morning. And for those who are here for worship, let me just uh, give an extra word of welcome to guests and visitors who are with us this morning. We're so glad that you are here. And let me share just a few things that are happening in the life of the church um, in the week or two that are coming up. I um, want to just quickly begin by saying a thank you to everybody who uh, came for the presentation from Ryan Carp last week. I hope that you guys enjoyed that time together with him. It was, I think, very informational. He's a fantastic speaker, as always, and so thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and uh, I know he very much appreciated your, your attentiveness and willingness to be here. Uh, we look forward to having him back again. Um, I believe he will be coming uh, sometime this summer uh, to fill the pulpit. Um, uh, at some point this summer as well. So that'll be exciting to have him. Um, this, su today, this Sunday, right? Yeah, after this, after this service is our new members luncheon. Uh, we're very excited to have that uh, happening today. We have eight folks who are gonna be joining us uh, for the new members luncheon. And so uh, that is good, good news. Um, those of you who are gonna join us, we had been telling you to go down the east hallway and we were gonna use the Sunday school classroom there. But as it turns out, we've moved it. So we're gonna be in the west hallway. So after uh, worship and after coffee hour, if you'll make your way to the west, hallway. Um, there'll be a luncheon ready for you there. Um, and we'll actually get started before coffee hour's over um, so that we can be uh, mindful of everybody's time. Um, but we look forward to meeting together with you today for that. Uh, this Wednesday, the 14th, is, uh, yes, Valentine's Day, but it, is also, it also happens to be Ash Wednesday and the beginning of the Lenten season. And so we look forward to meeting together with you for the beginning of our Lenten dinner and discussion series. That happens every Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, we start with a dinner, um, home-cooked dinner, and then we will have our, our discussion study time that will start about 6.45, 6.50. If you are a, a Wednesday evening study person, this takes the place of Wednesday evening study for the Lenten season. And yes, we start just a little bit earlier. Um, if you're coming for, or for dinner, please come at 6. If you want to just come for study, please come about 6.45. Um, the theme for this year's uh, Lenten discussion is going to be grappling with the weight of our sin, and it is going to piggyback off of our Sunday series, which is sackcloth and ashes. We're going to talk about the ancient practice of wearing sackcloth and ashes, and why did the ancient um, uh, Israelites do that, and, and what was the purpose of all of that, and how does that apply to our lives? I think it will be very interesting um, and probably help us to think a little bit more about how we address our sin. So um, I, I want to just quickly say, I know that we're talking about grappling with the weight of our sin, and we're talking about sin on Sunday mornings, and it sounds like it's going to be a very sin-filled Lent, um, which doesn't sound very exciting. Um, my hope is that you know me well enough to know that we're not just going to leave every Sunday with sin. Uh, it is going to be very grace-filled as well. Um, what point is there in talking about our sin if we're not going to talk about the grace of Jesus as well? So um, please come. It's going to be a great time and uh, look forward to all of that with you. Next Sunday, the 18th, is our Texas Roadhouse uh, Dine to Donate fundraiser. We are very excited to have lunch with you. Don't forget, next Sunday, we will not have our normal coffee hour time. Uh, we're going to instead ask you to just meet with us over at Texas Roadhouse for lunch. Um, last week, we handed out, or two weeks ago, I guess, we handed out uh, the, the Dine to Donate sheets. If you need more, they are available at the information desk in between the bathrooms on the east side of the building here. Um, but this happens this, uh, this coming Sunday 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can either dine in or you can do curbside pickup. Um, whatever you do when, when you either pay for your receipt to dine in or you pay to, 
to do your curbside pickup, hand them that sheet with your receipt, and uh, we will get 10% of the proceeds of everything you purchase. Um, this will be a great time of fellowship. My family will be there to fellowship together with you. We'll try to um, meet up with you at all of your different tables. Um, I'm going to throw a little encouragement out there. Um, you know, there's some big tables over there. Maybe meet up with folks you don't necessarily know that well and have lunch together and use it as a time to get to know one another. Um, but it will be a great time uh, of sharing together. Also, I would encourage you, share those forms with your neighbors, with your friends. Ask them to come and have have lunch with you or uh, come and have lunch and help us out as well. It's a great opportunity to add a little bit to the bottom line of the church. That's next Sunday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Texas Roadhouse. Um, sledding party, that happens on Saturday, the 24th of February. A couple things to say about that. Yes, it was 50 degrees this week. Not exactly helping our cause. Um, so two things you need to know about this. The first is you have to sign up today if you are intending to go to the sledding party. Okay, that's the first thing because as of right now, we have four people signed up and four people does not a sledding party make. <laughs> the second thing is that um, as of this weekend, Villa Olivia has been closed because they can't make enough snow to battle 50 degrees. So that throws a wrench into our plans. Um, we need to know how many people would seriously want to go like to Moretti's just for the pizza party because uh, if we're going to cancel, we have to cancel Tuesday <laughs> in order to avoid having lots of costs. So if you are seriously considering going to the sledding party or going to Moretti's for pizza with us, you need to sign up today, okay? If we don't get enough people signed up, then we are going to cancel so that we don't end up losing lots of money um, before Tuesday. Um, if we end up canceling, it's, not, it's, it's fine. Um, you know, just the Lord had different plans for us this year, I guess. Um, but just so everybody knows, we need you to sign up today um, if we're actually going to do this thing. If we're going to cancel, that's fine. We just need to know. Um, also, our next uh, Saturday morning breakfast study is coming up uh, March 9th. Our last one was very well attended, I think 25 or so people. Um, we look forward to maybe having more uh, at the next one. March 9th is our next breakfast study, uh, and we will have a home-cooked breakfast for you beginning at 8.30, and then uh, a short study after that. We will try to be done by 10 or 10.15. I think it was about 10.15 this last time. And so um, we hope that you will join us for that. It's just usually a great start to, a, uh, to the weekend. We hope that you'll participate in that with us. And then one last announcement. Our next movie night is also coming up uh, soon. Uh, Saturday, March 16th is our next movie night. We're going to be watching the movie Faith Like Potatoes. Um, if you've never seen this movie, it's a fantastic movie about... Um, a, a potato farmer in South Africa who um, deals with the issues of racism, uh, apartheid, those kinds of things. Um, and he has to give up his very successful potato farm, move into another area. He ends up becoming a sharecropper and it's just the tra travails that he goes through. But he sees God's grace all the way through the whole thing. So it's a fantastic movie. Um, we hope that you will join us for that uh, Saturday evening, March 16th, 6 p.m. We will have the concession stand again, um, and we'll do the same thing. Bring uh, a lawn chair. We will have some extra lawn chairs, camping chairs for those who don't have them. But that worked really well to make our own movie theater last time, so we'll do that again this time. Um, Jeannie, what else did I miss? Oh, I got the thumbs up already. Okay, good. In your bulletins this morning, you'll also find our prayer list. Um, thank you for praying with us for the folks who were on that list last week. Um, and we ask that you would continue to pray for those folks and join us in praying for the folks that have been added to the list. Um, and uh, I'll just quickly note one thing on that list. It's not often that we add things um, of a national nature, but I'm sure many of you heard about the disaster with the Marines, the five Marines who were 
unfortunately lost in the helicopter incident this week, and we thought that was um, a crushing blow for those families, and they can certainly use our prayers. So please be praying with us for them um, this week as well. Would you please join me in a general word of prayer? Father, we do thank and praise you for the opportunity we have to gather together in worship today. Thank you for calling us together into your house. As the psalmist said, we rejoiced when the brethren came unto us and said, Come, let us go into the house of the Lord, that we might give worship and praise. Father, it is because of you and you alone that we are in this place. We come to give you all the worship and praise that you are due. But Father, we benefit so greatly by being here. We benefit by having the support of the brothers and sisters, by seeing one another, by hearing about each other's lives, and by being fed by what each other are doing, by hearing about what you have done in their lives this week. So Father, thank you again for this place that you have called Cornerstone Faith Community Church, for these people, for this family, for the joy that we have of gathering together. And Father, thank you for this great nation that we live in, where we have the freedom to gather together. We don't have to gather in secrecy. We don't have to hide. We have the ability to gather together openly and worship you. Father, we have so much to be thankful for, so much that you have given us this week. You continue to provide for every need. Father, you have heard our prayers. You have healed those who have had surgery. You have continued to care for those who are sick. You have knit back together those who have been injured. And so, Father, once again, we come and we humbly kneel before you this morning with even more requests. We lay before you those who are sick, those who are injured, those who are grieving, those who have great need. Father, there are some who have material needs and some who have financial needs some who have emotional or spiritual needs, and other, Father, whose relationships are struggling. Father, in each and every one of these situations, would you come and hover over them? You, Lord, know what each and every one of these people needs. And so we ask that you would work in their situations that you provide for them, care for them, comfort and love them. And Father, that along the way you would draw them closer to you, that they would come to know you, that they would come to love you and honor you. And Father, this morning, as we draw near to your word, we hear about the wonderful words of life that you have given to us. We are reminded that it is your word that keeps us on the right path. It is your word that causes our hearts to sing. It is your word that leads us so well. It is your word that gives us strength and encouragement. And so, Father, now as we turn open the pages of your word, as we hear once again the the letters of your word. Would you send your Holy Spirit that we would have your wisdom, your discernment, that these words would fall fresh on our hearts and in our lives, that we would hear once again the wonderful words of life that you have given to us. We ask all of this, Father, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come now to hear God's word, I would ask that as you are able, wherever you are, you would stand for the reading of God's word. That as we hear God's word this morning, it would fall fresh on our hearts and in our lives. This morning, we conclude our series, Sing the Wondrous Story, by looking at the words of Psalm 119, beginning at verse 9. May God add his blessing to the reading of God's word for this day. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, last week I introduced you to Philip Paul Bliss. He was the writer of several of the most well-known hymns of our faith, including Hallelujah, What a Savior, and the tune to It Is Well With My Soul. This week, we're going to conclude this message series, Sing the Wondrous Story, by talking about Philip Bliss one more time and another one of his beloved hymns, Wonderful Words of Life. Now, you might recall that uh, last week I ended my introduction of Philip Bliss by noting that his life was cut short when he and his wife were tragically killed in the great Ashtabula Railway disaster of 1876. Well, in the two years prior to this great tragedy, Bliss had taken to the railways, traveling almost constantly to sing for evangelistic revival meetings that were spearheaded by the Reverend Dwight L. Moody of Chicago. Bliss usually traveled on those trains with a man by the name of Major D. W. Whittle. Now, Major Whittle was renowned throughout the Midwestern and Southern states as one of the foremost evangelists and preachers that was associated with the evangelistic meetings of D.L. Moody. He was called Major because of his time serving in the 72nd Illinois Infantry during the Civil War. Among Major Whittle's most notable participations in the Civil War were the battle at Vicksburg, and I think this is pretty cool. He rode just to the right of General William Tecumseh Sherman as they rode through and stormed the forces of Georgia. After the war, Major Whittle settled in Chicago, and he went to work for this little clock factory called the Elgin Clock Company. He became acquainted with D.L. Moody by attending services at his Illinois Street Church. Eventually, Moody became aware of Major Whittle's profound gift for writing poetry, and he actually had a great gift for public speaking. And so D.L. Moody strongly encouraged him to take on the career of becoming an evangelistic preacher. Major Whittle's uh, penchant for lyrics and for poetry, along with his gift for evangelism, are where his path crossed with Philip Bliss, our hymn writer. Of the nearly 200 hymns that Whittle wrote, you'd probably best recognize two. One is, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing, 
And the other one is, I know whom I have believed. We're not here to talk about Major Whittle, even though he's a pretty cool guy. We're here to talk about Philip Bliss. In the year 1874, he and Whittle are traveling the nation as part of the Moody Evangelistic Crusades. At that time, the latest edition of Philip Bliss's collection of hymns is set to go to publish. It is simply titled, Gospel Songs. Among the hymns that are included in that collection that have since lost their popularity with the church are hymns like, Brightly Beams the Father's Mercy. Come, brethren, as we march along, and have you believed on the Lord? But one hymn that remains sung nearly as often today as it was in 1874 was a hymn that Bliss originally titled, Sing Them Over Again to Me, Wonderful Words of Life. Interestingly enough, Philip Paul Bliss was never a wealthy man. And he unfortunately died before he ever really saw much uh, of an income from the hymns that he wrote. But he did make a lasting mark on the evangelistic campaigns that he was part of. Bliss directed all of the royalties that would come from the writing of these hymns and the sales of these collections of hymns, the, specifically the 1874 gospel songs, he directed that they would be given to the evangelistic campaigns of D.L. Moody. You ready for this? Over time, Bliss's gift would amount to more than $30,000. Not bad for a barely educated backwoods boy from Pennsylvania. There is something that stands out to me about the hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. It is not a theologically rich hymn. In comparison, for example, with a hymn like, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, this hymn does not necessarily make us get out our Bibles and start researching topics like reconciliation or propitiation or righteousness or redemption or any of the other really hard to understand theological words. But that does not necessarily make this hymn somehow lacking theologically either. In fact, let's look again at just the words of the second verse of this hymn, okay? It says, Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. In this one verse, Bliss has incorporated the following theological concepts. First, the idea that the gifts of Jesus are freely given to all people. The idea that Jesus calls to everyone, sinner and saint alike. The idea that the words Jesus speaks are life-giving words. And the idea that Jesus' words are words which call us heavenward. The hymn might sound simplistic, but its message is so much deeper than what first meets the eye, and that truly is the genius of good hymn writing. Um, approximately 40% of all of the music that we sing in worship is music that has been written by a group of musicians who are collectively called Sovereign Grace Music. This collaboration of talented songwriters and musicians is headed up by a world-renowned Christian musician by the name of Bob Coughlin. It is staffed by Coughlin's children, Devin, Gort, Jordan, and Mackenzie, as well as a, a dozen other talented writers and musicians from around the globe. And every couple of years, our worship team travels down to Louisville Yes, I said it right, Louisville, to Worship God Conference. It's put on by Sovereign Grace Music in conjunction with the Sovereign Grace Churches, especially Sovereign Grace Louisville. 
And uh, this coming July, our worship team will travel down for, I believe, our fourth conference, either fourth or fifth, something like that. Now, the question is, why do we continue to go to this conference? Aren't there other groups, aren't there other conferences to attend? And the answer is sure. But there are, there are two things about Sovereign Grace music that stands out to us. The first one is this. They have this beautiful simplicity about the music that they write. Congregations can actually sing it. The second thing is that they have a theological commitment, a scriptural commitment. Just like Philip Paul Bliss, the folks at Sovereign Grace are writing music for the church that is easy for the church to sing, easy for the church to understand, and most importantly, clearly and simply communicates the truth of God's word. Why has a hymn like Wonderful Words of Life remained so popular for 147 years after its writing? Because it is just as true today as it was when it was written. And it is just as singable today as when it was written. God's word is still as wonderful today as it was in 1847. Those words are still as life-giving today. They are still so freely given to everyone. I mean, sure, the way that we write music has certainly changed over 147 years, hasn't it? This hymn doesn't sound like a modern worship song, does it? But that's part of its beauty as well. This hymn speaks to us out of its history, out of its experience. What was true about God's word then is still true about God's word today. That's the reason that I've chosen to conclude this message series with this particular hymn. I mean, there are so many other hymns that I could have chosen for us to look at today. You probably have a list you wish I would have chosen. I've already heard from a number of you that you're hoping I'll do part two of this series because I didn't pick the right hymns. <laughs> By the way, I will do part two at some point. But I'm going to conclude today with the wonderful words of life that are God's word. Truly, there is no other source of life for the believer's soul than God's word. Here's the thing. Do you need strength? Go to God's word. Do you need hope? Go to God's word. Do you need encouragement? Go to God's word. Do you need to be corrected? Go to God's word. Do you need to know that someone else understands the predicament you're in? Go to God's word. Whatever it is that life throws at you, fellow believer, God's word has something to speak to you, something to speak into your life about that moment in your life. Now, if you are a seasoned saint, see, that's a really nice way of putting it, right? If you are a seasoned saint, that statement doesn't come as a surprise to you. You've lived that truth your whole life. You've experienced over and over and over again the joy of running back to God's word in life's most difficult moments. But for some of us who are less seasoned, for those who are maybe even just beginning this journey, it might seem hard to believe how can it be possible? How can it possibly be that God's word can speak into every moment of my life? Well, for starters, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Paul, his letter to Timothy, encouraged Timothy to cling to God's word by saying that all of Scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training up in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In wonderful words of life, 
Philip Bliss suggested that God's wonderful words teach us faith and duty. They woo us to heaven. They sanctify us forever. These are absolutely life-giving characteristics of God's word. And more than this, we can turn to our text for today. The second movement of the longest chapter in scripture, Psalm 119. And we can find that the psalmist agrees with the writer of Hebrews, with Paul the apostle, with Philip Bliss on the versatility and the life-giving function of God's word. So this morning, I'm going to offer to you three ways, three ways that God's word, God's wonderful words offer us life. Here's the first one. God's word sets my life on the right path. God's word sets my life on the right path. I want you to listen again to the first verse. I'm sorry, verse 9 of Psalm 119. Verse 9 of Psalm 119 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? The psalmist answers that question by saying, By living according to your word. Now, surely, though the psalmist speaks here of young people, the truth is applicable to every age. The path that leads to destruction doesn't discriminate based upon age. Young and old alike, right? If we want to take the righteous path, we should follow the word of God. William MacDonald put this verse into the context of a young man's life by saying, one of the most crucial problems in the life of every young man is how to keep pure. The answer is practical obedience to the words of the Bible. And that's true enough. Though if social media is any evidence today, it isn't just young men who are vulnerable to the path of impurities. God's word is the perfect partner for anyone who needs to find their way. Or or maybe we should say it this way. God's word is the perfect partner for everyone who needs to find their way back to God's path. In The first eight verses of Psalm 119, which we didn't read this morning, the psalmist was intent on keeping the laws of the Lord. Verse eight in particular was a bit of a plea on behalf of the psalmist. He says, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. In other words, the writer here is attempting a a deal of sorts with God. I'll do what you've told me to do. Just don't forget about me. The very idea that the psalmist would be able to do what God has told him to do suggests that the psalmist is somehow aware of what it is God has said to do. The psalmist knows the wonderful words of God, and so he claims anyways that he will do his very best to do whatever it is God has said to do. As the second movement of this longest chapter of the Bible opens up, verse 9, the psalmist continues this thought from verse 8. But now he asks this question, so how do I actually go about doing that? How does a young person actually stay on that path of purity? How does one actually go about doing what God requests of him? Well, the answer seems very obvious to the psalmist. By living according to your word. So what's more then, at the end of this psalm, the psalmist reiterates this intention by suggesting that he's going to find three ways. In fact, he doesn't have to find them. He knows three ways that he can live according to God's word. I rejoice in following your statutes. I meditate on your precepts. And I delight in your decrees. 
That's how I live according to God's word. I rejoice, I meditate, and I delight. In order to rejoice over something, usually we need to have received some basic sense of pleasure from whatever it is we're rejoicing over. We don't usually go around, by the way, saying how happy we are, how joyful we are with something that has just caused us pain, discomfort, or some kind of displeasure, right? To meditate on something means that we are deeply focused. We have focused one's mind completely for a period of time on something. So presumably the psalmist here, this young person, this young man has been able to focus his mind on something. Probably something that has brought him great delight. Probably not going to be something that has caused him agony or frustration. The psalmist has used these words about God's word. Can you believe that? I rejoice, I meditate, and I delight. Now let, you remind, let me remind you that presumably, this psalmist here is a young person, presumably a young man. Can you create in your own mind a scenario under which today a young man might be heard saying, hey, I rejoice in following God's word. Hey, I willingly meditate on it daily. Hey, I take great delight in doing everything God's word says for me. It would certainly be an anomaly, I think. But Philip Bliss reminds us in his hymn that it shouldn't be so strange to rejoice in following God's word or to meditate on it or to even delight in it because after all, Bliss said, it is made up of wonderful words that give us life. Words that lead men and women, young and old, to the path of God's purity and righteousness and ultimately which keep men and women, young and old, on the path of purity. God's word is full of wonderful life words which set us right, but ultimately which also keep us right, which is point two for us today. God's word keeps me on the right path. Verses 10 and 11 of our text to dive deeper into this point. It says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Biblical scholars have often suggested that wisdom writings, writings such as the song that we're reading, describe the difference between right and wrong, and they describe it using two viewpoints on ways to live. Dr. Al Mohler Jr. describes these two different viewpoints or these ways to live as paths. He suggests that the wise path leads to life and the foolish path leads to death. In order to be sure that he walks the wise path as often as possible, the psalmist recognizes that he has to do more than just read God's word. Dr. Moeller says that the psalmist understands he must lodge it in his mind and soak it in his heart in order to bear the ripe fruit of wise living. Lodge it in his mind and soak it in his heart in order to bear the ripe fruit of wise living. In other words, do you remember when the psalmist earlier said that the way to keep the young man on the path of purity was by living God's word? Well, he takes one additional step now. He says living God's word is so much more than just reading the Bible. Living God's word has to do with what happens when your entire being is steeped in God's word. I don't know about you, but I find coffee to be an interesting phenomenon. Some of you have your coffee here this morning. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. For all intents and purposes, coffee is, no, coffee is nothing more than just hot water that has been passed through a bunch of crushed up beans. The beans themselves, by the way, are bitter. Some people find joy in eating these beans. They find them to be a delicacy, but 
you have to recognize that most people who eat these beans, even those beans have to be covered in something like chocolate to make them even palatable. However, when the coffee beans are roasted and then they're ground up into a pulp and the hot water is passed over them, there's this resulting liquid that can be quite pleasing to the taste buds. But what is required for the resulting liquid to be pleasing? Well, the hot water must be completely steeped into the beans. Did you catch what I said? The hot water has to be completely steeped into the beans. We so often say that we have steeped our coffee beans in hot water or we have steeped our tea bags in hot water in order to produce tea or coffee, but we're actually not concerned with the beans or the leaves, are we? We're concerned with the water. And the water must be completely transformed completely covered in whatever the bean or the leaf can produce. That's what Dr. Moeller meant when he described the psalmist's words as hiding God's word in our heart. God's word must lodge and soak in the heart. Even this idea of hiding God's word in our hearts seems backwards to us because usually if we want to share something, we don't hide it, right? If it is so advantageous, why would we hide it? But in this case, hiding doesn't mean to keep it away from someone. It means to put it in a place of great importance and protection. Why would the psalmist give God's word such a prominent place? Why would he be so careful to find such a special place to keep God's word in his heart where it would be protected and always at the ready? Well, verse 11 is the answer to that. It says, that I might not sin against you. In other words, that I might stay on the right path with you. God's wonderful words of life absolutely set us on the right path, but they also keep us on the right path. Without them, we are prone to wander aimlessly. The third point for this morning, then, is this. God's word helps me to help others to get right with God and stay right with God. God's word helps me to help others to get right with God and stay right with God. In Bliss's hymn, Wonderful Words of Life, there is a great sense of universality. These wonderful words of life are absolutely for me, but they aren't just for me. They are also for you and they also for Well, they're for anybody who would be willing to listen. It should come as no surprise that Bliss and his text would be so inclusive. After all, he was primarily writing hymn texts for evangelistic revival meetings. Now, those are three words that we northerners don't usually put in a sentence. But you get south of the Mason-Dixon line, and we hear them a lot, right? His greatest desire was to see as many people as possible, one and all, come to know the Lord. So it is fitting that he wrote lines such as, Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. And sinner, list to the loving call, offers of pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. And that is how God's word is supposed to work. We get it. We gain from it. We cherish it. We thrive on it and we protect it, but we never hoard it. It's probably the only gift we've ever been given that there's an expectation that we will re-gift it. God intends for others to gain from his word through you as much as he expects you to gain from his word. Perhaps this was in part Bliss's motivation because of his mentor, Dwight Lyman Moody, who was singularly convinced that God's word was all that we needed for every instance of our lives. D.L. Moody once wrote, 
Here then is our guidebook, our textbook, the word. If I utter a syllable that is not justified by the scriptures, don't believe me. The Bible is the only rule. Walk by it and it alone. Other than the Reverend Billy Graham, I doubt there was any more successful evangelical preacher in the United States than D.L. Moody. His revival meetings and crusades proved opportuni- provided opportunities for thousands to come home to the Savior Jesus Christ, both here in Chicago, at the Illinois Street Church, later at the Moody Tabernacle, and throughout the Midwestern and Southern states. The reason that Moody and, and Major Whittle and, and Philip Bliss and Franny Crosby and Dr. George Root and all of these folks found such great success in their evangelistic endeavors because they were convinced that there was no more important task in all of this world than helping other people get on the right path and stay on the right path with God. They were equally convinced that there was only one thing that could make this possible, a deep devotion to God's word. So the final verse of Wonderful Words of Life calls us to sweetly echo the gospel call with wonderful words of life. What is the gospel call? I want to borrow a phrase from Major D.W. Whittle, that other guy we talked about this morning, that traveling partner and colleague of Philip Bliss, in his hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed. He asks, do you know whom you have believed? Here's one verse of Whittle's hymn. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Can't you just imagine the numbers of men and women who came to those revival meetings? They heard Whittle and Moody speak, and they sang the hymns that Crosby and Bliss and Whittle, and they were actually living this very sentiment. They said, I can't quite understand how it is exactly that God gave me this saving faith, or how it is that believing in his wonderful words of life have actually brought peace to my heart. I can't quite understand why it is that God actually gave me this, but this much I do know. The one thing I actually know, I know who it is I have believed. And I am completely convinced by God's word that he is more than able to keep me on the right path until that day when he comes back for me. That is one beautiful moment made possible and brought to you all by God's beautiful, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of life that set us right, keep us right. Wonderful words of life that help us to help others get right and stay right. Amen? Father, thank you for the wonderful words of life that you have given to us. Father, we thank you for each and every one of these hymn writers that we have talked about over these last six weeks. We thank you for their beautiful testimony of your word. We thank you for the history that surrounds these songs. We thank you for what you were doing in in this world at the time when these people were writing. We thank you for the way that they continue to speak into our lives. Father, will you continue to fill our lives with your wonderful words of life? Will you continue to help us to run to your word to get right and to stay right? And Father, will you help us to help others 
to know that it is only by your word that we can be made right. Father, we ask this in the name of the one, the only one who makes us right, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you that uh, we have been given wonderful words, and these words give us life. You need strength? Go to God's Word. You're looking for hope? Go to God's Word. You need a little correction? Go to God's Word. You're looking for somebody who knows your situation? You go to God's Word. Because these are wonderful words of life for you. Go with the love of God our Father. 
the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, Wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you next week.